let me tell you something. If the U.S. government decides to stick a tracking device up your ass, you say thank you. And God bless America. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And with me today is my good friend, Eric Breen. He's been on the Comics Aficionados once, but he's a resource, a, a wealth of knowledge that I really haven't tapped into enough. And so I'm really happy to have him on the channel today. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing good. How's it going? I'm doing well. You know, so we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, perceptions of the way that the comic industry views you and maybe some of the, I'll call you old timers, you know, some of the old old guard, the, the older readers. You know, how long have you been reading comics? I started reading regularly at about like November of 1975. And with very few exceptions, I've I've been reading, you know, every week ever since. So about 45 years. Thereabouts, yeah. <laughs> I don't know you personally, but I don't believe that you're not a millionaire or anything, right? Uh, no, if I was, I would still have my 50 plus thousand comic book collection that I had. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not a millionaire, but you've invested countless hours, dollars, so much of your time into this hobby. You've invested a lot into this, wouldn't you say? Oh, I, absolutely. I said, you know, I, I am a comic book fanatic, but I'm, you know, but, but I don't really get into the other, you know, things that kind of go along. Like a lot of people are into gaming and, you know, sci-fi and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, I'm just like, when I'm not reading comics, I'm watching sports. So comics in, in this vein, that is my passion. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, it, so yeah, it's, I have, yeah, I've invested a ton of time and, you know, and like have I said, you're not a millionaire. You, you're, you're investing money because you love it. It's not because it's just, well, I got the money. Let me go buy that. It's you love comics. You want to read that the next great Superman comic. You want to read the next great Spider-Man comic, right? The next great story. Well, yeah, real quick. I said, when I bought, my copy of the first issue of the incredible Hulk, someone had shot a BB through his head. Fortunately, the exit wound was on the back cover. <laughs> so there was just a little BB size hole on it. So I got a several thousand dollar book for like $180 and I was thrilled. <laughs> so, you know, Cause I, I, could, I mean, you know, I've owned AF 15 fantastic four, one Spider-Man one. I've, I've had them all. There's a disconnect, you know, in, the comic community and in, in the in the in the culture and i think there's this weird idea that maybe the old guard older guys like yourself and i you know i'm you know i'm in my 40s you know you're a little bit older than i am that you know we're just boomers and we just you know get off our lawn and, and we don't want new new readers to come in we we want to keep it all for ourselves i mean is that how you feel about comics I mean, that i don't want new readers yeah, yeah. The, no, you, absolutely not. I, on, this is this is my hobby. I don't want anyone in here. I'm the only one that people should be writing comics. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I I absolutely recognize that you know times change. You know how the how the you know comics are done. You know need to change with the times. I would just argue that not all the changes have been for the better. It, it seems like comics it you know, perpetually chases the demographic that they desire but can't get at the expense of the one they already have but no longer want. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but, you know, I, I can't help but feel that that's, you know, the way the, the, the comic book industry has gone in the last, you know, 15 years, give or take. You feel like the industry wants to leave you behind and they no longer want you even though you've, You've put decades of passion and interest in it. You've spread the word about comics. You know, you're one of the people that, that I've learned comics from. I know that you don't want this all for yourself. You're always telling about people about great comics. You're always wanting to, to encourage people to go out and read them, correct? Yeah. And it's hard, I said, because, I, I, again, the industry does a terrible job of preparing the next generation. Because, like I said, you know, I, when, when I started, you know, there was – pinball i mean the the earliest video games hadn't been invented yet and so it was easy for the printed page to compete with you know pong 
-hmm. But now look at, you know, you can get video games with those characters that are so realistic that if you see a commercial for one, you initially think it's for the next MCU movie until you realize it's a, a video game. Um, well, plus they're, what, they're competing with new mediums. You know, if you have a mobile phone, you have access to thousands of free games. Absolutely. And a lot of them are really fun <laughs> and they're addictive. You know, I call them time sucks. They're basically just in there to get you to, to use your time. But, uh, you know, those are free games. Comics aren't cheap. You know, it's, it's, no. it's, it's become a crowded field. And then you have Netflix where, you know, for one uh, price a month, you get unlimited access to cartoons and other you know, TV shows and movies that are literally designed for that same audience. So it's, it's very competitive. Yeah, and, you know, so with that in mind, who do you think you have the best shot of getting in their wallet for these comic books? And it's people, you know, our age that the, we've stood the test of time. You know, we're still here. And it's like they can't get rid of us fast enough to suit them but who are they going to replace us with? Now, again, I'm not saying that they should cater everything to me because I said, you know, I am pushing 60. So there's only so many more years they can get me as opposed to like a 20 year old that you want to last as long as I have. But how do you get them, you know, without, you know, it's like, it seems like they're losing my generation prematurely. They're not getting the next one. So comic sales have kind of flatlined. Does it feel like they're, it, it feels like they're taking you and I for granted. Like, well, it doesn't matter what we put out. They'll always be there. You know, they've got no nothing. They don't have alternatives, which, you know, really isn't the case. Back issues. <laughs> there yeah, that, there are literally a million comics out there that I haven't read that haven't been, that, that were already published. Absolutely. I, you know, I, that's, I mean, you guys joke about uh, someone named me Breen has back issues in one of our chats because, I mean, that's that, that absolutely is what my focal point has become because, you know, like I said, I had a 50, 55,000 book collection at one point. And I'd like a lot of those back, if not the, the comics themselves, the stories. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm constantly looking for, you know, the trades that those would be in or the epic collections or the masterworks or the omnibuses or or just the individual issues and i don't need to like i said if if i go in a store to look for iron man and she's a teenage girl you know nothing against that and you know if people like that great i would just as soon rather go you know buy a handful of the back issues from when tony stark was iron man that i remembered liking when i was younger like i said you know i or I'm sorry. So one of the things about when I when I sold my collection is I was no longer tethered to the runs. So Dan Slot started doing crazy stuff on Spider Man. I didn't have 700 issues of Spider Man to keep up with. I just can say no thanks. So I'm no longer buying. So that's that's the only silver lining that I have out of not having that giant collection anymore. Is now I can just look at things. I said you know. I, you know, Detective Comics, I was reading the Mr. Freeze storyline and I saw that Tom Taylor was writing the next issue. I passed on that and start and got the next one again. Because, I mean, I, it might might have been a good story, but, you know, I didn't feel the need to buy that to keep my run going. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing I said. When comics are four or five dollars a pop, you know, it's crazy to keep buying a book because you have all the ones that came forward. But and, and then what does that even mean now? When at Marvel, no title lasts more than 25 or 30 issues before the you know, next crazy, relaunch. Um, you know, Doc is a little bit younger than me, so you know he's, he's younger than both of us. And he was an X-Men completionist. And he was willing to shell out massive amounts of money to keep his X-Men collection going, you know, because he wanted every issue. And then when they, I think it was when they launched X-Men Gold, they, one of the variant covers was $1,000 the very first day. <laughs> just totally taking advantage of customers and try to taking advantage of the old guard, you know, like us and Doc, to where you know they he's got that 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 complete run. He's gonna have to spend that thousand dollars and really just taking for granted that that he would do it. And they ended up driving away, and now he's not an X Men completionist. He can not buy a copy of X Men whenever he wants now, and it doesn't doesn't really bother him anymore. 
Marvel's predatory practices have just gotten so out of, out of, out of hand. And I said, and again, I said, I've, you know, I've been going to the same comic book shop for almost 40 years. So I've seen how Marvel treats the retailers and it's, it's been a poor relationship for decades. You know, yeah, we'll give you this variant, but you have to buy 50 copies of this book that you have no chance of selling. You know, it's, it's one of the weird things is, is you know, we're talking about uh, the, the comic industry feeling, feeling like they're taking the older guard for granted. And there's been there's kind of conflict, you know, the, the newer readers and the older readers maybe having different tastes. I think one of the real issues is um, leadership at Marvel and DC. They're all old guard. So they only know how to distribute market to people like us. So when they bring in a rainbow or a well and they, they put her on runaways and it's essentially intended for tweens or, or maybe uh, females, you know, in the early twenties, they're still marketing and distributing the book. Like their customer is our age. And then they're like, that book's not supposed to be you. Why, why do you even care? It's like, <laughs> why are you distributing it in all the places where people my age are? Th that, that should be, <laughs> In in you know your your lifestyle you know section at the at a comic book shop or in a an independent bookstore or or Barnes and Noble or whatever, uh, and it shouldn't even be distributed in, in floppies. You know that's not how nineteen year old girls really consume uh, their books anymore. Why are you distributing the model? They're not changing to the new audience, and that so they're bringing us into conflict with each other, and then wondering why we're not getting along. Don't you? They're, they're instigating the conflicts themselves, and then they're wondering why they're happening. Marvel could have fixed this years ago, and it, it would have been so simple. What I would have done, if, if they put me in charge of Marvel, say, six or seven years ago, I would have said, okay, we're going to have three divisions. We're going to have the you know Marvel you know, 616 proper, which you know is, a, is strictly a comic book universe that follows what has come along in the past in the comics. We're going to have an MCU line of comics where that team of the Avengers are the ones from the movie. It will be the characters as they're portrayed on television and in the movie. Continue continuity there. Absolutely. Yeah. The because my biggest gripe was, you know, like for the first couple of years when they tried to make everything fit the movies, in the comics, it was like, okay, that's that's kind of like a lose lose for me because I like them being separate. And then 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 they started replacing all the characters with the kids. That's mm -hmm. a you know, whole other can of worms. But the third one I would do would be like the the equivalent of a of a YA line, and that's where they could have that's that's where Iron Man could be Riri Williams and Amadeus Cho is Cho is the Hulk and. Miles Morales as Spider Man. That's where you put your champions, your Ms. Marvel, your Runaways, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they can have their own universe. And if one of the characters becomes a breakout star, like you know, Harley Quinn was initially in the Batman animated series, correct? Or somewhere mm -hmm. along, yeah. You know. Yes. And she became so popular that they had no choice but to put her in the DCU. Now, you know, what has happened since then? You know, we could we could talk for days about how badly that's been mishandled, but that's you know that's not today. Um, and you, you know, those three lines of comics, you know, you have you you could have kept the better talent, you know, the writers and the artists, you know, like the your brew bakers on you know writing and the you know uh, Steve McNiven's on art because you know those books might continue to sell because they are appealing to the comic book fans. Then you you try to tap into the movie audience. One thing the industry's never learned is they are two different audiences. Comic book fans will watch comic book movies. Comic book movie watchers don't become comic book fans. You know that that's a tough get. Why not sell? You know, if you had if you had a MCU universe, why couldn't you have a rack of comics in every concession stand at a movie theater that just mm -hmm. sell? the MCU comics. Yeah, absolutely. Those, in those MCU books, they wouldn't need to be in floppies. You'd want them to be in stories. And maybe, hey, you really like this introduction to the, to the uh, MCU Steve Rogers. We got four volumes. These are the, you know, these are the follow-up stories that'll get you ready for his next adventure. They're available right now if you want them. 
boom, you know, you wouldn't yeah. have to keep coming back every month, you know, because it's like I said, it's a different audience. It's a different type of consumption. You know, a movie audience is someone that's used to movies. Well, I think if they were like, oh, you read them one issue at a time, but it's not a story, you know, it's so they can take up the 10 issues. So it, you might have to wait 10 months to read, read your story. It's like, yeah, yeah no, remember, no one else is doing that. But comic book fans, we're the craziest people in the world. Remember how good the the Marvel Ultimate Universe was in its first four or five years? Mm -hmm. Which was a good thing because the Marvel Universe was absolutely trash at the same time. Um, and I will give Bendis credit. You know, he had a lot to do with the you know, Ultimate Universe being good for those early years. But that universe wasn't intruding on the Marvel Universe. It's an alternative. Yeah, you know, so like when, when Kasat, you know, there were still a few good years in the ultimates when casada really got marvel you know the the regular universe humming again but like i said and then you know eventually of course they panicked and you know brought characters from one into the other and, and but that was again probably another poor decision made due to oh my gosh what do we do now Go and ahead, whenever that happens the decision making process always goes south it's unfortunate that, that they they haven't identified new marketing strategies and it essentially just makes, you know, guys like you or me or Doc or Paley, it makes us feel, oh, what, we're irrelevant now? You don't love us anymore? You know, I've, I've given you how many years, how many dollars? But, uh, you know, I'm not worth your time anymore. It just does feel like I'm severely underappreciated. Oh, there's there's no question. Um, Marvel, in my opinion, has completely left me behind. Yeah, I, I still, yeah, I picked up Spider-Man Life Story and I am, reading symbiote spider-man um but as far as the radio I, I just don't feel like any of it i'm not gonna say none of it's aimed at me but too much damage was done during the alonzo era for me to trust them especially when you know they might be doing some better books and and they are i will give them credit for that but when you hear sana amanat say we don't want to be a comic book company as much as we want to be a lifestyle brand and that tells me, okay, you care more about whether or not Ms. Marvel backpacks are selling at Walmart than whether or not you're giving me a good Spider-Man book. And I'm not saying that you can't do both because you can, but I'm not seeing the results in the, the monthly books. And I'm still not seeing anything to make me come out of Marvel retirement. Whereas at DC, at least, you know, right now, you know, at least, you know, as long as you know, Tynan's on Batman. We have a, you know, two or three good Batman books and yeah, nowhere to go if you like Superman, but yeah, you know, you know um, Justice League is still solid and Venditti's getting a crack at that. So that'll be worth reading. Um, there, there are still things to find. You know, you know, my crotchety old you know, reader can find a handful of things at DC that I, I really just can't find at Marvel. Yeah, I'm just I'm finding much more things actually on the indie scene. You know, obviously they're not capes, but you know, it's a lot of like noir or, or horror books and stuff like that. But uh, just the way that that the industry's gone, I've, I've definitely uh, expanded my horizons on you know what I'm willing to read and, and try out. And you know, I've, I've discovered a lot of really good indie comics lately, which is which has been nice. And, and there are some. I, I said obviously, Criminals as good as anything being published and. Yeah, I, I've heard you know, great things about stuff like Oblivion Song and you know Ascender and a couple other things that you know may not necessarily be my cup of tea, but you know, it, you know, it, there does seem to be a little bit of a creative surge in the Indies, and I, I'll tell you, yeah, you know, there's a lot of good stuff today. There's a lot of great stuff in the '80s, and I think create you know, creatively, there you know, when when Image came, it's basically changed everything in the indie game. I think you know, creativity might have taken a backseat to literally you know you know style over substance but um then that that kind of course correct and you know there's always been good indie gems out there it's just that sometimes they've been a little harder to find right now they're pretty easy to find you know uh eric that's gonna about wrap up our time today like i said you know i don't have you on the channel enough we're definitely gonna talk a little bit more i know we're talking about doing a uh an old school comics and chill on aficionados maybe next month if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter 
at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.